Good afternoon, Poly 347 students. I trust everyone had a great weekend. Um, today we are going to be talking about First Peoples in Canada, the United States, and Mexico and their struggles to be recognized. Um, so that's chapter 10 of the course textbook we're principally going to be looking at, um, as well as a shorter piece on Canada's inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Um, but the, the bulk is going to be the chapter of the course textbook authored by Castro Ria and Altamirano Jimenez. Um, I personally thought it was one of the stronger chapters of the textbook. Um, I thought it was very informative and engaging, so I hope, I'm hoping all of you um, enjoy reading it as much as I did, um, so we will get into it. Uh, but before we do, I've got a few class annou announcements. Um, so midterm number one has finally been graded. Um, Y'all did very, very well on it. The class average was a, um, a very impressive 91%. Um, so I will try to circulate midterm number two study guide um, by 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. Um, the midterm number two will incorporate material up to and including next week, uh, but probably the bulk of the material is going to come um, is going to come in this week's lecture and, and sort of the lectures um, uh, the lectures since uh, since we moved to remote learning up to this week. Um, and another thing of note is that your second policy brief is due th this coming Friday. Um, that's May the 1st at 11.59 p.m. So it's said at one point on the syllabus that these were due at 1.50 p.m. I've decided to give you until um, the entirety of the day to get those in. So um, get them in by 11.59. Um, look for a, a turn it in link um, as was the case with your, your first round of, of policy memos. Um, so I'll be circulating a turn it in link um, hopefully by, um, by Thursday or Friday. So, so look, for, um, look for that in your inboxes. Um, so let's start with the lay of the land. Um, let's start with some figures and some facts that will hopefully put this chapter and today's discussion in perspective. Um, so in all three countries, um, Mexico, the United States, and Canada um, <clears throat> have one thing in common in that each of these countries, <coughs> indigenous peoples, um, comprise the single most disadvantaged population category. Um, so that's the case in Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Um, just to give you a few uh, vital statistics, um, in the United States, the median income for Native American households um, on the reservations um, is, was um, was twenty nine thousand dollars was twenty nine thousand dollars per year, um, according to the twenty ten American National Census. That's about half of the median household income for the general population. Um, in Canada, um, quite distressingly, um, seventy percent of Indian reservations lack regular access to clean drinking water. Um, so life on the res in Canada. Uh, probably every bit as brutal as it is here in the United States, if not even worse. Um, and thirdly, in Mexico, um, about a half of the total indigenous community lives in extreme poverty. Um, so the global category for extreme po poverty are um, people who live on around the equivalent of $2 per day American or less. Um, so we're looking at very stark statistics um, that really unite all three countries um, in that indigenous communities um, in each of these three countries not only share a common ancestry, um, but also a common quality of life um, as, of, um, as of the present. Um, so let's go, uh, let's go a little bit back to, um, to before each of the countries were founded. Let's go back to Turtle Island. Um, so let's um, revisit some of the pre-colonial terrain that we discussed earlier in the semester or, or at around the beginning of the semester. Um, so pre-contact North America was a complex ecosystem of north to south economic, cultural, social, and political exchanges, um, which comprised over 300 known nations um, that lived in the Western Hemisphere prior to, uh, to first contact. Um, the, the subsequent creation of national borders um, that ran north to south um, imposed a kind of artificial east-west logic on the subsequent exchanges that took place between indigenous communities. Um, so the logic of European settlement and the logic of indigenous um, habitation were two very orthogonal things and two very 
contradictory things. Um, so to this day, you see a number of different tribes um, that straddle either the Canada-US border or the United States-Mexico border. Um, so there's absolutely no consistency between how Europeans drew borders um, and pre-existing tribal arrangements and, um, and societies. Um, the dynamic has, in the age of globalization um, and deeper global economic integration, uh, been complicated by the deepening of globalization, the creation of new frameworks for economic development, capitalist market-oriented economic development, um, as well as the expansion of a competitive global market. Um, national governments now contend with international pressures in the domain of indigenous relations. So that's going to be a very big theme of this entire chapter and this entire lecture. Um, so here is a kind of rough map of the territorial divisions in Turtle Island as it existed prior to European contact. So as you can see, there are a number of different communities, the Huron, the Sioux, the Mohawk, um, the, uh, the Haida, that um, will straddle and cross national borders. Um, so there's not any kind of consistency or rhyme or reason of uh, the borders between the United States, Canada, and Mexico and pre-existing communities and pre-existing um, tribal divisions. Um, so when we talk about government indigenous relations, um, as with a lot of things, we have three different countries and three distinct regimes. If we're gonna simplify a little bit, um, we can look at, when we look at each country and how each country has managed um, Indian affairs over time, we can identify three distinct patterns. Um, the pattern in the United States is a long process of domestic domestication. Um, so the thrust here is that American administrations at the federal level have continually and um, sort of subsequently and, um, and overlappingly worked to limit the scope of treaties and to deny tribal sovereignty um, to Indian peoples, often through um, sort of the accretion of new laws and laws building on top of other laws. Um, in Mexico, the paradigm has been one of assimilation. So Mexico is unique among the, these three countries in that the majority of Mexicans um, claim at least some level of indigenous ancestry. Um, so the, the dominance of the mestizo race in Mexico has brought with it a thrust to bring Mexico's remaining indigenous inhabitants closer into the cultural mainstream identity, um, into embracing Mexicanness as both a racial and a civic identity, as we've touched upon at, at points, um, points at various points this semester. Um, in terms of Canada, the general approach um, with varying degrees of consistency has been one of accommodation. Um, so for the most part, Canadian governments um, at both the federal and provincial level um, have looked at relations with various Indian bands and Indian communities um, as a set of bilateral negotiations um, that can vary substantially from time to time, from time to time, on a case by case basis. Um, so, taking each indigenous community within Canada as a nation within a nation um, that is entitled to the same kind of norms that Canadian diplomats and Canadian diplomacy would extend to, uh, to foreign countries, the same dignity and the same level of recognition. Um, so each distinct logic is evident in a different comprehensive policy relating to First Nations people. So in the chapter we're reading for today, um, uh, three distinct laws have been identified. In the United States, the law in question is the Indian Self-Determination and Educational Assistance Act of 1975. Um, in Canada, um, uh, the law in question is the First Nations Governance Act of 2003. Um, and finally, in Mexico, the piece of legislation in question is the Indigenous Law in 2001. And the, the, um, the authors argue that you can infer different regime types, different approaches, and paradigms um, on the basis of these major pieces of comprehensive legislation. 
starting with the United States, um, uh, generally, um, generally speaking, if we're looking at the broad sweep of government Indian relations in the U.S., we can look at the process as a long period or a long process of domestication. Um, so in the United States Constitution, um, Indian tribes are more or less lumped together with foreign nations. Um, so the president has the power to negotiate and to sign treaties, but it's ultimately Congress that has the power to regulate commerce um, with the Indian tribes. Um, so early on in American history, um, of early American governments, there was a concerted attempt to play nice with Indian tribes, um, to attempt to use diplomacy whenever possible to adjudicate various land claims um, and various um, territorial disagreements and territorial issues with the surrounding Indian tribes. Um, so early American administrations, they worried correctly that Indian wars, um, so any kind of hostilities that could break out between uh, the American colonists, um, the, the new United States government, and various Indian tribes, um, that would invite foreign meddling. They were right. Um, they were right in that Indian wars that broke out later on in the 1800s absolutely did um, bring in the British and the French and the Spanish at, um, at various points in time. So this was a, a correct instinct for them to have. Um, so on that basis, between the years 1778 and 1781, the United States Senate um, ratified some 370 separate native treaties. Um, so you have early on in the United States history um, a concerted and I think a good faith effort to be a good neighbor, um, to establish cordial relations with the various Indian tribes um, that are in the continental United States at this point in time. But it's ultimately the impatience and the wanderlust of American settlers that forces the government's hand to uh, abandon this norm of accommodation. Um, so you have a very sharp influx of European settlers um, uh, that comes in in the last two decades of the 1700s. Um, and they have at this point a voracious demand to um, sort of identify and, um, and cultivate land of their own. Um, so it's these European settlers, um, the sort of pressure that they're placing on available land um, that ultimately leads to uh, further hostilities and open hostilities with various Indian tribes. And there's not a whole lot the American government can do about it. Um, so by the end of the 1700s, um, you saw a number of Cherokee settler skirmishes break out across the southeast, including here in Kentucky. Um, so at this point, um, you have... A, um, a failed policy on the part of the United States government. You have America's population um, largely forcing the government's hand to move towards a more punitive stance towards Indian tribes. So unsurprisingly, Indian wars um, become a fixture of the American social landscape um, throughout the 1800s, leading all the way up into the Civil War. Um, one of the most prominent of these wars, um, the Indian Wars, that really grew from being a localized Indian War to bringing in um, international attention and ultimately the involvement of the British um, at this point in the North American co uh, colonies, um, was the War of 1812, which, uh, which despite its name lasted all the way to 1815. Um, so this was a conflict that involved on one side a multi-tribal confederacy led by the, the legendary warrior Tecumseh, um, which joined forces with the colonists in British North America, present-day Canada. Um, and this alliance fights the United States to a stalemate. So as many of you will know, at the climax of the War of 1812, um, you had the burning down of the President's Mansion, uh, which would later become the White House. Um, uh, one of the most egregious and controversial acts uh, of this period of time, or really any period in American history, was the Indian Removal Act of 1830, um, which was championed and ultimately implemented by then President Andrew Jackson. Um, so this act forced the removal of nearly all Native Americans um, from the eastern United States to areas west of the Mississippi. Um, so following the implementation and the installation of this act,
approximately 6,000 Native Americans died along the Trail of Tears. Um, so this period in American history has been designated a genocide um, by various historians and various scholars. I think there's a strong argument to define it as such. Um, the very next year, um, a landmark Supreme Court case, um, the Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, um, uh, came down, and within um, the, the majority opinion in this case, um, authored by uh, by then Chief Justice Earl War um, Chief Justice John Marshall, um, uh, found that um, the Cherokee people should be defined as a domestic dependent nation. Um, so that means they're capable of some functions of self-governance, but not all. Um, and because the Cherokee are incapable of truly taking care of themselves, um, they should be viewed to have a relationship with the federal government as something akin to a parent-child relationship. So there should be some type of paternalism um, connecting Indian tribes like the Cherokee um, to the federal government. Um, Indian tribes, at this point in history, were denied uh, the full prerogatives of self-governance due the, to the perception that they were incapable and unable to, uh, to govern themselves. Um, so following the Civil War, um, you have another watershed in which the United States altogether um, abandons the practice of treaty making. Um, limits this and, and chooses to attempt to, through legal means, through means of stealth, to progressively limit the scope of pre-existing treaties. Um, so the General Allotment Act of 1887, um, at this point um, passed under the presidency of Rutherford B. Hayes, um, gave the president the authority to allot tribal lands to non-native peoples for a period of up to 25 years. Um, and during this period of time, um, the reapportioned lands would be held in trust until their native inhabitants demonstrated that they have the aptitude to manage their own affairs. Um, so again, um, getting at the prior Supreme Court, um, the Supreme Court decision, the, the Cherokee peoples versus the state of Georgia, had again articulated a stance of paternalism. Um, and following this process, tribal lands would be converted to fee simple land. Um, so land that was fully owned and recognized under American federal law um, as belonging to its indigenous inhabitants or its indigenous owners. Um, and the owners by this period of time would become full United States citizens. So there was kind of a paternalism slash assimilation uh, bent to this policy. And during this period of time, the United States Department of the Interior um, followed an active policy of attempting to move non-natives or encouraging non-natives to move into tribal lands. Um, so this invoked a kind of legal loophole here in that federal law still applied to American citizens um, who went and lived in, um, in native lands or native reservations. Um, so by making those individuals subject to United States federal law, this was part of a larger overarching strategy to over time um, in a very stealthy and incremental manner. Um, pick away and, um, and eat away at the legal privileges, um, the sovereignty, the tribal sovereignty um, that had up to this point in American history been enjoyed by, uh, by Native Americans. Um, so pushing forward to the 1950s, um, you have a much more aggressively framed termination policy um, that becomes the norm and becomes the, uh, the thrust of the United States federal government. Um, so under this termination policy, there's a push for natives to end their social isolation and, um, and their segregation and to live in integrated cities as Americans. Um, so under this policy, some 109 separate tribes are nullified. Um, and a major feature and a major hallmark of this policy is the Indian Relocation Act of 1956, um, which creates incentives for natives to leave the reservation and uh, find, um, find industrial work, find blue collar work off the res. Um, so this, uh, this act funds moving costs and vocational training. 
Um, an estimated 750,000 or three quarters of a million Native Americans um, took part in this program of relocation. Um, so you saw a massive out-migration during this period of time from the reservation to cities. Um, so you saw a partial reversal of this trend of assimilation during the 1970s, um, which as you know was a very turbulent decade in all three of the countries we're talking about this semester. Um, but in particular, um, you had American Indians um, take inspiration from the broader civil rights movement that was going on um, that featured most prominently black Americans um, and develop their own civil rights discourse um, that romanticized the way that Native Americans lived um, prior to, uh, to colonization and um, prior, to, um, prior to the United States, or the pre-American um, way of life. Um, so the Native population in this framing, in this discursive view, was reimagined as an internal colony that needed to be liberated. Um, so there were a number of prominent protest activities that took place during this period of time that drew a substantial amount of attention from policymakers in the media, um, one of which is the, was the occupation of um, the Alcatraz prison um, near San Francisco, um, which persisted from 1969 through to 1971. A few years later, you had a set of protests that took place at Wounded Knee, South Dakota, um, culminating in the death of two protesters and uh, the injury of about a dozen more. So you had some accommodation of this sentiment from the federal government um, through the Indian Self-Determination and Education Act of 1975. Um, so per this act, tribes were given the power to initiate self-determination contracts with various federal agencies, uh, prominent among which were the Department of the Interior and the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, however, the federal government stopped just short of recognizing the full autonomy of native lands, um, which under the letter of this law were still held in trust by the federal government. Um, you saw a broader trend that was embodied not only in this act, but also the broader discourse um, that characterized the 1970s going into the 1980s. Um, so natives here, Native Americans, um, they were folded in to a broader war on poverty rhetoric. Um, and within this rhetoric, they were conceptualized as just another poor ethnic minority group, um, as opposed to a distinct group um, that had certain distinct and unique prerogatives and certain unique land claims um, on the basis of its history in the United States. Um, so you had something of a conflation of the circumstances with Native Americans, um, with those of Black Americans, Latino Americans, and other impoverished minority communities. Um, so moving on from the United States to Canada, um, you can look at Canada's history of government indigenous relations as comprising a bumpy road to reconciliation between the two categories. Um, so bear in mind the term Aboriginal in the United in, in Canada um, has a somewhat different meaning than it does in the United States. Um, and Aboriginals in Canada um, fall into three distinct categories. Um, the first of which are First Nations. Um, the term First Nations refers to any of the hundreds of pre um, pre European communities um, that populated mainland Canada prior to the European ar arrival. Um, the term Inuit is a special term that refers to the first peoples who live in and around the Arctic circles, um, who, so those who live in the Arctic territories like the Yukon, like Nunavut, um, the Northwest Territory, etc. Um, and finally, the Métis, who we've talked about. Um, these are mixed race descendants of white settlers and First Nations. Um, so those three communities, while distinct from one another, collectively comprise um, individuals who are recognized as Aboriginals in Canada. Um, so early on in Canada's history, um, you have a relationship between early European settlers um, and Aboriginal communities um, that's consensual and for the most part mutually beneficial. 
Um, so at this point, you have a roughly even balance of political power um, because Canada is very, very rough terrain, and it's a very hostile climate as compared to the United States and, um, and Mexico, not just in terms of its um, – uh, of its temperatures, but also its um, its geographical and topographical climate. Um, so the harshness of Canada's terrain made Europeans dependent on First Nations know-how and First Nations guidance. That gave First Nations communities a level of power um, within the rapport, and that Europeans needed them um, more than they needed Europeans. Um, so that gave that put the First Nations in the driver's seat. Um, in terms of, of bargaining relationships. So an important turning point in this relationship um, came with the Royal Proclamation, um, which was issued following the British defeat of the French. Um, and, and once the British um, claimed primacy throughout all of British North America, um, so through this proclamation, the British recognized Aboriginal tribes as autonomous political entities. Um, that were capable of, in and of themselves, signing treaties with the Crown. Um, this subsequently evolved into a strategic tool that allowed the British cr Crown to claim more and more land within Canada. Um, so despite its innocuous framing, it was used in a very kind of advantageous way, ultimately by the British inhabitants and settlers of, of British North America. Um, so following the British North America Act of 1867, uh, the federal government took over control from the Crown um, of indigent Indians and lands reserved for Indians. Um, so the government subsequently set up a reserve system, so a system of forced segregation uh, between Indian and non-Indian lands. So that was starting in the early part of the 1870s. Um, so subsequent to the creation of the reserve system, it gets consolidated in the Indian Act of 1876, um, which creates a registry of Indian bands and increases federal control over, um, over Indian reserves um, and uh, the sale of crown lands sort of to Indian communities and from Indian communities. Um, about a decade later, amendments to the Indian Act make attendance at church-run residential schools compulsory for First Nations children. Um, so to this day, residential schools are a massive black mark on Canada's history. Um, they served as no less than tools of cultural genocide. Um, so children at these residential schools, um, and to, to this day there are thousands and thousands of, of horrific accounts of mistreatment of children at these schools. Um, they're taught about their own cultural inferiority vis-a-vis -vis European communities. Um, they're subjected to constant physical and sexual abuse. Um, so Canada's Roman Catholic Church runs about 60% of these residential schools. Um, so it's um, you think of the United States as being the more religious of the two countries between Canada and the U.S., but it's important to note that you have a separation of church and state in the American Constitution that does not exist in the Canadian Constitution. So here is an example of a fusion of church and state um, that leads to truly horrific consequences for the, uh, the First Nation children who are subjected to the residential school system. Um, so just to give you a few of the more jarring statistics about residential schools, um, so residential schools um, founded in the 1880s, um, stayed open until the le until 1996. So the very last residential school finally closed in 1996. Um, and throughout the operation of residential schools, an estimated 50, uh, 150,000 First Nation students, children went through the system. Um, an estimated one in 25 stu students died over the course of attending residential schools. Um, so this is a total body count of around 6,000, just over 6,000. Um, and of the survivors, um, over 35,000 of them have since sought comp compensation for severe sexual assault, leading to some $250 billion Canadian in damages that have been paid out um, as of 2015. 
Um, this is truly one of the most shameful corners and dark spots and, and black marks in Canada's history. It's a source of substantial controversy and substantial debate to this day. Uh, so despite the fact that res uh, residential schools are no longer in operation, um, this issue is by no means closed. Um, so moving from the 1970s through the present, um, more so than in any of the other countries, First Nations activists in Canada um, have been quite strategic and quite successful in the way that they've utilized the court system, um, as well as the constitutional reform process that was going on through the 1970s and into the 1980s and the early part of the 1990s. Um, so through these mechanisms um, and through these sites of contestation, um, uh, Canadian First Nations have been quite successful in having the principle of continuing sovereignty established under law. Um, so starting with the Calder case of 1973, it's been established and reaffirmed by the Supreme Court of Canada that historical land claims may exist independent of treaties, um, in that there's a claim to sovereignty held by First Nations that predates Canadian Confederation and remains valid through Canadian Confederation. It exists independently of the existence of Canada as a sovereign nation. Um, so moving along through the Constitution Act of 1982, Aboriginal and treaty rights were formally affirmed and written into the Constitution of Canada under sections 25 and 35. Um, so there was an attempt to build upon this recognition 10 years later um, through the, the, um, the Charlottetown Accor Accords, which were sort of an omnibus addendum to the 1982 Constitution. So it was sort of an effort to get in everything that was viewed as a shortcoming or a blind spot of the 1982 Constitution and get that into a new regime. Um, so this proposed a constitutional right to First Nations self-governing. Um, so despite the fact of this right being written into the Charlottetown Accords, the Charlottetown Accords themselves um, were later defeated in a contentious national referendum, um, which to this point has killed the process of constitutional reform in Canada. It hasn't been revived or resuscitated since. Um, so moving on, in the year 1996, um, you had a Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, um, which, which had been established four years earlier. Um, table its final report. Um, the government, um, in response to this report, issued an apology to the Aboriginal people for a history of mistreatment, but has to this day failed to act on uh, the report's recommendations in their entirety. Um, so to this day, you've had a few attempts to have the report formalized in federal law, but none of them have to this point materialized. Um, so this takes us to um, this, just this past June, um, where an inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls issued its final report. So this inquiry was one of the very first thing that, things that Justin Trudeau did um, during his time as Prime Minister was to launch this inquiry. And it finally issued a report after almost four years in the field. Um, the report documented at least 1,017 homicides and 167 disappearances of ab indigenous women and girls uh, between the years 1980 and 2012. Um, so this murder rate is five times higher than the rate among the general population. Um, the report quite importantly implicated the government and the Royal Canadian Mountain Police in deliberate race, identity, and gender-based genocide. Um, so the report's use of the G-word, genocide, is quite substantial in that um, there are a number of different conventions and protocols internationally relating to genocide and acts thereof. Um, so genocide being on the table now, it opens up this situation, the situation of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, potentially to further action under international law. 
Um, so it's potential that survivors and allies um, could file a brief um, in some forum like the International Criminal Court or the International Court of Justice um, if their concerns are not acted upon um, to their satisfaction by the Canadian government. Um, so that's yet another um, problematic and troublesome dimension to the debate. So finally moving on to Mexico. Um, so Mexico is unique of the three countries um, in that a majority of Mexicans will, will claim some level of indigenous ancestry. Um, so there's not as much of a racial separation between indigenous Mexicans and mainstream Mexicans. Um, there's a closer racial relationship between indigenous Mexicans and Mexicans in general. Um, so you've had indigenous communities from the get-go, from the start uh, of Mexico as an independent nation, be, be, be substantially more active and substantially more visible in mainstream politics. Um, so in 1810, after declaring independence, Mexico decided to abolish Indian status altogether. Um, so the rationale here is that any form of racial distinction would only serve to harm a collective Mexican, Mexican identity um, and would only serve as a potential source of division between the newly unified Mexican people. Um, so the idea here was to establish Mexicanness as a civic identity and not a racial one. Um, so with the 1917 Constitution, you had a slight accommodation, but nevertheless, a uh, general reaffirmation of the notion that Mexican is a civic identity and not a racial one. Um, so despite this proclamation, um, there were a few concessions um, that were made in the 1917 Constitution towards uh, predominantly indigenous peasant farmers. Um, the largest one concerned ejidos, which were communal plots that were granted to landless indigenous farmers. Um, these could be farmed under the, under the Constitution, but not bought or sold. They could be farmed and inherited, but uh, a title to them could not be transferred. Um, so it was a type of communal ownership. Um, and throughout its, its period of dominance, um, the PRI pushed a policy of in, um, indigen, <laughs> indigenismo, or an indigenous assimilation. Um, so the PRI, again, was quite savvy about co-opting potential sources of opposition in society. Um, and one of the ways they were able to do this was through the National Indigenous Institute, which became a home for the pro-PRI educated indigenous elite. Um, so the PRI always had a small but influential indigenous backing. Um, so this changes dramatically um, during the 1980s and actually during the run-up to regional free trade. Um, it is a set of reforms that are made in anticipation of deeper economic integration with the United States that really set off the indigenous um, and create a response that, um, a reaction that persists through today. Um, so in the run-up to NAFTA, um, and, and as a way of preparing for NAFTA, um, through the 1980s, um, the PRI incrementally reforms the Hito system um, this really draws the ire of indigenous farmers who are able to collect and mobilize a number of sympathetic allies. Um, as a way to try to again accommodate and co-opt, in 1992, the PRI passed a round of accommodating constitutional reforms. Um, so Article 27 and the Hedo system here were gutted, but um, changes to the language in Article 4 um, affirmed uh, a distinct set of indigenous rights in Mexico. Um, so the indigenous community and their, or their, and their distinct identity um, were for the first time ever written into Mexico's constitution. Um, and accompanying the constitution, you had a new agrarian law, um, which gave ejido tenants the legal right to sell or rent their plots or to use them as collateral for loans. So this was again, part of a broader effort to assimilate the indigenous into the mainstream market economy. 
Um, so in opposition more than anything to these agricultural reforms, you had the Zap uh, Zapatista uprisings begin in the Chiapas province um, starting in January of 1994 and continuing through to today. Um, so the Zapatistas demanded full autonomy from Mexico's indigenous people um, and were quite, again, savvy and quite strategic about being able to, to build alliances both within Mexico and abroad. Um, so the Zapatistas were a very successful mobilization, um, which had a lot of success in drawing attention to their cause um, and placing pressure on the government to, uh, to play ball. Um, so you had, in response to the Zapatista uprising, the, uh, the implementation of a new indigenous law in 2001. Um, so this indigenous law, quite interestingly, was passed by a majority of Mexicans, or was, um, was reaffirmed by a majority of Mexican states, but that did not include Chiapas. Uh, so Chiapas, the, which is the epicenter of uh, the Zapatista uprising chose to reject the indigenous law, but it was nevertheless passed over the objection of Chiapas. Um, so this law recognized limited self-government of Mexico's indigenous people, but denied collective land claims. Um, so moving on to a set of conclusions, and I apologize for how lengthy this lecture has been, but there's a lot of meat here, and I found a lot of very interesting um, aspects of this discussion for all three countries. Um, so governments in all three countries have expressed a willingness to bring the indigenous into the economic mainstream. Um, so it's not a great look for any of these countries, but especially the United States and Canada, to have third world conditions persist in native communities. Um, it's a substantial source of embarrassment and shame for all three countries, but especially for the United States and Canada. Um, however, there's something of a catch-22 for uh, North America's first people in that entering the market will invariably entail either one, leaving reservations, or two, letting non-native investors in. Either way, First Nations lose political autonomy. Um, so they're kind of damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. Um, so in short, we're putting First Nations in all three countries to a greater or lesser degree into a set of circumstances in which they're forced to choose between either one, self-governance, or two, market-oriented development. And they'll always risk ending up with neither. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I hope you enjoyed listening to this lecture as much as I enjoyed creating it. Um, I genuinely think it's one of the more interesting topics that we're going to be covering this semester. Um, so I will get your discussion questions, which your discussion question, which will deal with the film Roma. I'll get that up on Moodle by Wednesday, um, and I will get your um, your midterm number two guidelines up by tomorrow morning. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for your time and your patience. I hope you all have a great rest of your afternoon. Goodbye.